The last part of the Industrial Revolution that we will be discussing in class examines the relationship between capital and labor. The Industrial Revolution agitated or inflamed long-standing social tensions. Remember how just um, later in the 18th century, just a little bit of, of time ago, uh, the French Revolution was brought about by social tensions, existing issues between different social classes. Well, the French Revolution did not resolve those issues because social classes still exist here in the 19th century. In fact, the gap between rich and poor will increase heavily, which will actually make the social tensions even worse. Um, the industrial capitalists were a new addition to what was uh, called the middle class. We've been referring to that as the bourgeoisie. And what will happen um, as a result of this is we get a new way of understanding society called conflict theory. This is sort of an innovation of the 19th century, which is where this, there's an increasing idea of class consciousness, or the idea that um, how much money you have or your socioeconomic status, your place in society, um, determines your perspective. So people who belong to different social and economic classes have conflicting interests. So if I am an entrepreneur, it's in my best interest to make a lot of money. But if I am a working class um, factory laborer, it's not in my interest to make the most amount of money for the company. It's in my best interest to you know, make enough money to feed my family. Well, the more I'm paid, the less money the entrepreneur can make. So you see how there's a natural conflict. So who made up this new class of factory owners that helped to strengthen the middle class? Well, some of these people came from privileged backgrounds, others from not so privileged backgrounds. Um, but again, okay, there was still an opportunity, at least in the beginning, for upward mobility, the ability to start lower on the social ladder and increase. Um, it became more difficult later on um, after factories had kind of been up and running for a while, but when they were new, pretty much anybody with the education and um, the motivation could do it. So formal education will become increasingly important for success because you have to know how to you know, run a business and all these kinds of things in order to move up on the social ladder, just like today. The more education you have, the more likely it is that you'll make more money. This is going to marginalize women or kind of push them to the edges um, away from industries because um, the 19th century, the Victorian era, will have them focusing on developing proper femininity, which includes you know, being good wives and mothers. So who are the new factory workers then? The new factory workers experienced the harshest labor conditions um, in Great Britain. People called Luddites were handicraft workers who attacked factories in northern England because they were actually losing work. Um, these were people who, it's sort of like the difference between going to the farmer's market and spending you know, $6 on a beautiful handmade dish towel and going to Walmart and spending, you know, 98 cents on one. Obviously, um, the people who, the handicraft, the skilled craftsmen were losing money because of the new factory system. With factories, you can produce more goods more cheaply and sell them at a less expensive cost than people who handmade things could do. Um, this guy, Andrew Ure, I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right, in the middle of the 19th century, just about, wrote that conditions were not as harsh as people thought and that the standard of living was actually increasing for the working class. This is going to be true after about 1840 because then real wages and pur purchasing power actually did rise. However, before 1840, the standard of living did not substantially increase for the lower classes, the proletariat. However, by 1850, the gains were evident. Um, they came slowly, though, and at a very high cost of pain and suffering early on in industrialized Great Britain. So there are some critics of early industrialization in Great Britain. William Blake, a renowned poet and author of the time, referred to early factories as satanic mills. While William, I'm sorry, is it William? Um, yes. Okay, um, William Wordsworth referred to them, uh, or discussed industrialization, saying that, I lament the destruction of the rural way of life and the pollution of the land and water. Furthermore, Friedrich Engels says, at the bar of world opinion, I charge the English middle class, the bourgeoisie, with mass murder, wholesale robbery, and all the other crimes in the calendar. Friedrich Engels depicted here will become a revolutionary later on, along with Karl Marx, ushering in the era of communism, or at least communist thinking. Conditions of work, what were they really like? Well, we read a little bit about it in class. 
Cotton mills were characterized by systematic obedience to the pace of the machines. So it's not like cottage industry where you're like, okay, we're going to work really, 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 really hard until 8 a.m. And then we're going to take a little break for breakfast and chill for a while. And then we're going to work really, really, really hard again at 10. No, no, no. It was constantly machine, 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 machine. If you um, did not abide by the rules, if you fell behind in pace, you were beaten or fined. Remember, this is like, you know, oftentimes a 14 to 16 hour work day, which is almost unimaginable for us today. Poor houses, where people who couldn't afford to live on their own um, ended up, required people to work strenuously. They didn't get any money just, just for the privilege of surviving, basically, for ha having food and shelter. Um, child labor of orphans was common. It was essentially slave labor. Um, the sexual division of labor. Um, women will suffer here as well. Now, women did work in factories. We discussed they worked in um, laundering factories primarily. Um, married working class women, however, were less likely to work full time for wages after they became having began having children. Wage earning women usually came from the very poorest families. Unmarried women worked in textiles, like I just said, laundering and domestic service. But there was no upward mobility for women. There was virtually no upward mobility at all. Today you talk about a glass ceiling, but this was like um like a glass floorboard. Women could hardly get above the surface. Um, women were very much, during the 19th century, restricted and confined to the home socially. The early labor movement in Britain sprung about um, because of the idea of class consciousness. Anti-capitalist sentiments rose in small and large factories, so this wasn't just a large factory phenomenon. This was workers everywhere, highly, just like, uh, almost violently resentful of the sort of the haves of society as they saw themselves as the have-nots. They also saw themselves as being pushed down by the so-called haves, this new factory um, owner class, along with the middle class, saying that they are basically leeching off of the hard work that they provide. So class consciousness developed as a result of the wealthy entrepreneurial bourgeoisie against the growing proletariat, or in other words, the uh, working class. Now, Britain outlawed unions and strikes back um, in 1799 in something called the Combination Acts. However, those will be repealed by 1825 because pretty much everybody ignored them. Um, Robert Owen was a particular socialist reformer who really um, led an upsurge in union organizing and actually for a time being organized a, nat a national union um, all across Great Britain. This will eventually crumble, but lead later to the Chartist movement, which, along with better working conditions, demanded universal male suffrage, suffrage being the right to vote. Through unions, then, working people demanded an elimination of wheat tariffs, so they basically they wanted cheap bread, a 10-hour workday, and universal suffrage. So there's the bread again. We still want to eat. They, don't, they only work for 10 hours a day, and they want the right to vote. So you can see here evidence of liberalism, because a major part of liberalism is the idea of universal suffrage, or um, the right to vote, but also this takes liberalism a step further. Um, liberalism, in, a, in the classical sense, the way that we saw it in the French Revolution and the way we're seeing it here, does not um, condone the idea of unions because it, there's a sense, sort of an emphasis on individualism and liberalism. They're like, well, you know, I'm going to do what's good for me, you do what's good for you, and they didn't see unions um, as being a good idea because, of course, that interferes with the invisible hand of supply and demand, right? That goes against what Adam Smith would recommend. However, socialists saw a, an absolute need for unions because the workers are being so horribly mistreated, as we saw evidence earlier in class and just now um, they're being overworked and again they feel like they're doing all the work and they're not seeing any of the profits so although there are um, traces of liberalism socialism is even further uh, to the left of liberalism liberalism will almost become the new moderate whereas before just an era before liberalism was the far left um, and it was embodied in the French Revolution so we'll talk more about this in class this is all I have for you have a wonderful evening Fairly well.